This spoils the game Police Knots and the book The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. This includes discussions of police brutality, sexual harassment, and sexual violence. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another, and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot. The only home we've ever known. I like Hideo Kojima's games. Like, I really like them. With a lot of video games, I'll finish it and think, well, that was good. Time to free up my hard drive. And that's where it ends. But Hideo Kojima games stick with me. On the surface, they seem straightforward. But there's always something there lurking in the depths. Something I'll spend years thinking about. For decades, Police Knots has been the elusive missing link of Hideo Kojima games. Kojima's team initially came up with the idea for the game in 1988 while they were making Snatcher at Konami. They worked on the game for four years after Metal Gear 2. Police Knots was the first time concept artist Yoji Shinkawa was brought on the team, the guy who has defined the look of Hideo Kojima games for two decades. Kojima also refers to Police Knots constantly in his other games. The names of Police Knots characters keep showing up in Kojima's games, like Meryl, Jonathan, and Ed. Even after Kojima left Konami, the Kojima Productions logo is of an astronaut. Most Hideo Kojima games are relatively easy to get a hold of in the United States. Most Metal Gear games have been re-released, some re-re-released. Even Snatcher, that rare collector's item, came to the US for the Sega CD, complete with a full English voiceover. Police Knots was only released in Japan, and only on shelves for a few years. Police Knots isn't unique in this way. It's hard to access any game developed more than a decade ago, let alone two or more. The game industry's model for media preservation is basically if the Library of Alexandria was a tire fire, keeping as little as possible accessible so publishers can keep wringing value out of the few games they do preserve. It was frustrating to know so much about this game just from the references of other Hideo Kojima titles, yet not have a way I could actually play it. Like, why would you show it to me if I can't have it? If it wasn't for the Police Knots Translation Project, who worked for years on a fan localization patch, the game would still be a mystery. I am forever grateful for their efforts. It's clear within the first minutes of the game that Police Knots is very dense. It's a visual novel first, with an emphasis on scenery and conversation over arcade action and tight gameplay. 
The dry detective mechanics involve a lot of clicking on and looking at every element on screen, to read about its personal, historical, and scientific significance. You play as Jonathan Ingram, a former space cop, a police knot, who was lost in space as a result of a spacewalk gone wrong during the early days of the Beyond Coast space colony. His rescue cryopod is found 25 years later, and now John is slumming it as a private investigator on Earth. His work isn't glamorous, taking kidnapping cases where happy family reunions are rare. One night, John's ex-wife comes to his office, asking him to investigate the disappearance of Kenzo Hojo, the man she married while John was presumed dead. The investigation brings him back to the space station beyond coast, and working alongside his former partner Ed Brown, who is now close to retirement and too old for this shit. Their investigation first uncovers something underhanded at the pharmaceutical wing of Tokugawa Group, where Kenzo Hojo worked. This international, no, interplanetary company may be funding Earth's lucrative street drug market. Maybe Kenzo was killed to keep this from coming to light. That's only the tip of the iceberg, though. There's a whole illicit operation connecting the mass kidnappings on Earth to organ harvesting on the moon, and the super-powered police apparatus overseeing everything at Beyond Coast. Put together, Police Knots may have the darkest setting of any of Hideo Kojima's games. Like, sure, there's perpetual war in Metal Gear Solid 4. There are robots wearing skin suits running around and brutalizing people in Snatcher. The world is cratered to near extinction in Death Stranding. But Police Knots ends without any assurance that the structural problems of the space colony can never be resolved. It's a bit of a meme that Hideo Kojima's games are layered in film references. In Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker, there's a staff member, Hideo, whose bio says that 70% of his existence is made of movies. In Snatcher, the references are pretty explicit. More than cute easter eggs, these references are supposed to reinforce the themes of the game by making parallels to those cultural touchstones. They can also be pretty subtle. Sure, John and Ed are visually similar to Detectives Riggs and Murtaugh, but their dynamic is also to play against the dynamic of the buddy cops in Rising Sun, which Hideo Kojima believed shared responsibility for a rise in Japan bashing. Senpai, apple pie, whatever it is you want me to call you, we have a murder here. I want to solve it. You'll probably find them irritating tonight. Do keep your hands at your sides. The Japanese find big arm movements threatening. The space race itself is cinematic. There's a wonderful video by Cal Calgren at Brows Held High on the cinema of the moon landing. Noting how NASA had a keen eye to the visual spectacle of their programs. In the moments before liftoff, the shuttles were filmed from every angle. And when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, they first set up a camera. Before the Apollo missions, before even Sputnik, there was the film Destination Moon. It wasn't the first film about flying to the moon, not by a long shot. Destination Moon, written by Robert Heinlein, was the first movie about spaceflight with an attention to accuracy. No Moon Men or Cheese on the Moon. Just enterprising Americans looking to make a round trip to the moon. All so they can sell that technology back to the US government at a premium. It's similar to an earlier novella Heinlein wrote, The Man Who Sold the Moon, about an entrepreneur, Delos David Harriman, making backroom deals to get funding for a commercial flight to the moon. What can I say? Highland really liked to put the venture in space adventure. It's a dry film and a little chilling now, in the shadow of SpaceX and Blue Origin. A corporation-led second space race also happens to be an important background element in Police Knots. Destination Moon was just the story of a trip. Visiting, yes, but not settling. There's not a good picture of what a human settlement would look like on the moon. 
Decades later, Robert Heinlein returned to the moon in fiction to marinate on the ramifications of a permanent outer space settlement in his 1966 novel, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. What would the United States do with a permanent lunar base? Why, they'd make it a prison, of course. Attackers, move in! The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, or Harsh Mistress, is about a revolution on the Moon's penal colony, led by a technician-turned-unlikely hero, Manny O'Kelly Davis, the organizer Wyo, the wise Dr. De La Paz, and the self-aware supercomputer Mycroft. The book is filled with big ideas. Highline was great at giving us sci-fi staples and uh, red flags. He's probably best known as the mind behind Starship Troopers, creating the template for the Space Marine. This book is no different. Harsh Mistress is the book that introduced the concept of kinetic bombardment weapons. It's also one of the first entries in the cyberpunk genre, with a lot of computer mainframe manipulation to fight the power. The ways that low gravity affects the lunar people, physically and socially, are also found in the Beltas of the Expanse. But the most faithful adaptation of Harsh Mistress's story is the very first original video anime, Dalos. The Moon Revolution is at first conceived of as a slow and careful operation by the tight-knit circle of protagonists. If the revolution is to have a lasting effect, the lunar people would have to have years of preparation to build up defenses against the Earth's armies if and when they try to retake it. If they can refit the docking catapult into a kinetic cannon and build a second cannon in secret, maybe they have a fighting chance. Unfortunately for them, before the end of Act 1, a wildfire of political unrest has removed the element of surprise. The Lunar Authority is placed on the wrong side of an airlock, and the Warden is brain dead after an act of sabotage. The Revolution now has to scramble out in the open to combat Earth's political subterfuge and be ready for when Earth goes nuclear. Along with the guerrilla warfare, political intrigue, and high concept action, the characters are also grappling with their new political agency and identity. The revolution is for a free Luna, but what does freedom mean? The writing is backed up with a strong understanding of the laws of physics. Heinlein's background as a naval engineer and academy instructor gives him a grounding in how things like a pressurized vehicle works and its effect on the human body. Like Destination Moon before it, Harsh Mistress describes the function of these science fiction devices in meticulous detail. For Heinlein, a spaceship isn't just a vehicle for an adventure. Being in a spaceship is part of the adventure. Books, movies, or games can be vehicles for discussing big ideas. Of how people's needs get met. How mass surveillance gets used. And the ways the law perpetuates injustice. Police Knots and Harsh Mistress explore how even in the ultimate escape of outer space, we'll be stuck in oppressive systems, unless we grow beyond societies of control. If an imagined world is supposed to be a vehicle for expressing ideas, the world building has to be airtight. The essayist Bob Case, better known on YouTube as Mr. Beatong, said that we can tell a lot about the depth of world building by asking simple questions like, what do they eat? In Fallout 3, there doesn't seem to be much of an answer. Everyone eats stuff from cans? Legally distinct Twinkies? Who cares? Check out this live nuke! In Fallout New Vegas, what do they eat has a meatier answer. Whole areas are dedicated to food production. Tying into a community's independence or reliance, there are quests that have major ramifications on these systems. 
About a decade later, and we have Starfield. What do people eat in all of these different worlds and space platforms? Apples. Inexplicably. Using that what do they eat metric, Police Knots is in a completely different stratosphere. I present the dinner scene. Act 1 has just ended with John and Ed making their way into a zero-g nightclub in the center of Tokugawa Tower, located at the center of Beyond Coast. It's a shady place filled with rich CEOs, made men, and corrupt politicians, overlooking everything that happens in the city. Its placement in the space colony is so striking and evocative. And... familiar. Where have I seen this before? Gundam? No, that's not it. Anyway, Act 2 follows this up with John, Ed, and Ed's kids eating dinner for an hour. Those are vegetables grown in Beyond's agricultural ring. They're ultra-high-pressure sterilized, so they're fresher than heat-sterilized ones. This is tempura. It's hard getting seafood here, so it's a little different from the tempura on home. It consists mainly of micro-organic proteins. Yeah, I love to cook, but they've got sensors in them that record the number of calories and portion sizes. Especially when it comes to solid food and there's too much phosphorus, your body won't be able to absorb the amount of calcium, but the balance between the calcium and the phosphorus. This is where the game loses some people. But for those looking for good world building, this is eating good. Maybe this is a reference to Lethal Weapon and how that movie had an uncomfortable dinner scene? Look a little closer and all of this is set up for the major events of the story. Those are vegetables grown in Beyond's agricultural ring. Agricultural ring. If there's too much phosphorus, your body won't be able to absorb the calcium. More than any one plot beat, the dinner scene is building up the stakes of the world. No sleight of hand is done to explain the problems of the space colony, and its issues hold up to scrutiny. We can't expect this world's solutions to come from a magic trick either. So what do the people in Harsh Mistress eat? Apples? Moon pies? The book is all about food. The impending threat is that the people on Luna are going to starve in less than seven years if things persist as they are. Not because they can't grow stuff on the moon. Decades of meticulous effort has produced fertile underground farms using complex hydroponic systems. It's not because the colony is wasteful. Food and the things that make food are extremely precious to the people on Luna. Water gets used and reused through the sewer filtration and irrigation systems. Even waste from food is considered a valuable commodity. People on Earth? They just flush money down the drain. That could have been sold to a farming cooperative. No, despite all of this effort, mass starvation is looming because the moon is forced to export more than they can produce. And as things stand, they can't change how it's done because the system doesn't even pretend to represent Luna's interests. For historical comparison, just look at Ireland's mass starvation due to Imperial Britain's import-exports. Or India's mass starvation due to Imperial Britain's import-exports. You know, maybe just take a good hard look at the British Crown. The question of food extends to the lunar culture. There's a whole mantra about how on the moon there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. It's kind of clunky and saying out loud is just awful. I'm gonna shorten it to no free lunches. In the book, the phrase is first discussed over a meal. Manny is talking to someone fresh off of the space boat about a cultural misunderstanding that almost got this guy into a lot of trouble. See, people on the moon have different values too. What's up, June? the Luna slang term for Earthlings, from the Russian word for Earthworms. On the moon, nothing is taken for granted. People have to work for everything, 
even air. Something like food doesn't just happen in space. If there is a free lunch being offered at a bar, there's a catch. Like the drinks there are more expensive, and it's only food that makes people thirstier, like salty peanuts. After all that, it seems strange that Manny pays for the guy's tab at the end of the meal. But even this isn't a free lunch. Manny's meal was purchasing that guy's sympathy. Someone who could have been put off by lunar life is now on his way to being a potential recruit for the coming revolution. This depiction of revolutionary action reflects the Black Panthers' free breakfast for school children program. Dozens of community programs with hundreds of volunteers feeding thousands of children before school. All free for the children and their families. This is maybe the most well-known Black Panther action. But this was tied to a much larger survival program which provided groceries, ambulance services, and medical research. What do school children eat? They eat well, says the Black Panther Party. An intentional outcome from this is that it reinforced an interconnected community support networks in underserved communities, and built up the legitimacy of people power outside of the government. Of the Black Panthers' different strategies, the Free Breakfast Program was the most threatening to the FBI. The government made their own free school meal program for kids, not because they were looking for an answer to child hunger, but looking for an answer to grassroots organization. With organizations like the Black Panther Party and the Rainbow Coalition curtailed, those government programs have since eroded. And when a system of control is the only game in town, there ain't no such thing as a free breakfast program across the United States. In the space station beyond coast, police surveillance is everywhere. Every person on a flight to or from beyond coast is accounted for. Building access, floor clearance, CCTVs. The police knots see everything in the city of the future. So... How did Kenzo Hojo go missing? It's like one of those locked room mysteries. The first two acts have the player diligently looking into these programs to verify they are all as robust as they say. Those CCTVs aren't just for show. The footage is heavily monitored. Kenzo couldn't have slipped away on a flight off of the space station either. The flight manifests track every single person coming in or out, and there is no gap in the records. But, well, that kind of gives away who would have the means to disappear someone. If everything is watched and controlled by the police knots, we know who has the spare key to the room. In these later acts, these surveillance systems are the barriers that John and Ed have to work around. With a criminal police force, how exactly are they going to get back onto Beyond Coast? Where can they hide if the police have a perfect view of every residence in the space colony? This technology is openly hostile to revolt. Ultimately, stuck on the moon, they figure, when in Rome, do as the Romans, and make use of the lunar colony's resource catapult. Harsh Mistress has a different take on surveillance technology. It's completely bought into the idea that technology will assist in mass liberation. At the very start of the revolution, the heroes have to use a rigid cell structure, where the resistance members only know a few others in the organization, in order to prevent a single point of failure from taking down the whole organization. But later on, thanks to computer encryption, the organization can be looser, and the revolution can work faster. They can also monitor member behavior to sort out the double agents within the organization, and put them in their own wing. 
leading them on wild goose chases so the Lunar Authority only gets bad information. No longer needing to operate cell to cell, the main characters can get quick reports of anything discussed over a phone on the moon. When word breaks out that the Lunar Authority has been raping and killing women in secret, a mass attack is coordinated that very night. This encryption is thanks to Mycroft, the AI born from the raw computing of the system that calculates ship arrivals and departures. Because Mycroft is hardwired for end-to-end -end encryption, it quickly becomes everyone's trusted confidant. And as it gets practice listening to and engaging in conversations, it develops its own voice and personality. It even makes its own virtual rig, Adam Selene. That's right, Highland predicted AI VTubers, too. In Dalos, this role is elevated even higher with its mysterious AI being seen as a sort of deity that is worshipped. And in the final act, Dalos is the literal deus ex machina. Harsh Mistress feels like the most hopeful that anyone has ever been about the coming advent of the internet. During the first Hackers Conference in 1984, one of the headlining events was the talk between Stuart Brand and Steve Wozniak about the coming information age. Stuart Brand had been an advocate since the 1960s on the potential for technology to help liberate the world. He campaigned for NASA to release images of all of Earth from space, turning the blue marble into one of the most widely distributed images ever. Steve Wozniak was one of the architects for the Apple II personal computer, a major leap forward in everyday people using computers. Forty years later, their exchange still gets quoted. On the one hand you have, the point you're making, Woz, is that information sort of wants to be expensive. Because it is so valuable, the right information, in the right place, just changes your life. On the other hand, information almost wants to be free because the cost of getting it out is getting lower and lower all the time. So you have these two things fighting against each other. It's a very compelling talk, but the exchange has a flawed premise. Cory Doctorow makes a point of it in his book, Information Doesn't Want to Be Free. Information doesn't actually want anything. It's a concept. Get out of here, object-oriented ontology. This book compares legal fictions to the reality of how software works. Legally, software reproduction gets put in the same category as factories making bootleg handbags. But computers literally function through one-to-one -one reproduction. Stream a movie, and the computer memory stores an exact copy of what is played. Treating this as a problem, distributors keep making digital rights management tools that lock out the user, install without permission, create hidden folders, and monitor how the software gets used. It's bad enough that this makes a lot of older software hard to run, but time and time again, this malicious code gets cracked and repurposed for computer viruses, which make the internet more dangerous. Doing research for this video, I became aware of how careful I need to be just to get basic facts from the information superhighway. Many trusted internet resources just aren't what they used to be. It's what Cory Doctorow calls enshittification. Like, when did Destination Moon come out? Just Google it, to get the wrong answer. Where can I go to get that patch for police knots? Ah, I'm not trusting my hard drive to this. I spent a while trying to hunt down the source for that Mr. B-Tongue video to make sure I was remembering it correctly, and not confusing it with one of his other videos. The shandification of Fallout was removed ages ago. I recognize that I'm not doing hard-hitting digital detective work in researching for this video. My love goes out to all those cyberpunks who fight against injustice and corruption every day of their lives. Folks like Maya Krimu, the hacker who leaked the source code for the 2019 U.S. government no-fly list. According to an analysis by the Council on American-Islamic Relations, over 98% of the names on the list they reviewed were of Muslim origin, 
including Mohamed Kairoula, the mayor of Prospect Park, New Jersey. Years ago, he was slated to take part in a White House celebration of Eid. But at the last moment, he was told that he no longer had the clearance to do so. Anti-Muslim sentiments are hard to combat when Islamophobes are in charge of the flight manifests. If it wasn't for its investigatory work, we may not have known for certain why that happened. Information doesn't want to be free, but people do. We'll be back after this short break. Like supposedly free lunches, there ain't no such thing as a free and open internet. Just the sort of free that has hidden costs. Viruses are free to download and install. Uninstalling? Well, that's a different story. There are movies and app games that are free. With ads. Of course, there are other ways to get that software, at the risk of your computer's health or legal trouble. Heck, it doesn't even have to be piracy. At time of writing, if YouTube detects ad blocking extensions, the website's functionality tanks. Ad blockers. You know, that sketchy extension that the FBI recommends we use. I don't know the situation of my audience, so I try to avoid pushing things that cost the viewers money, time, or security. But I do my best to share the cream of the crop of free. Free things that did their time in intellectual property prison, were paid in full, or made through those who want a thriving commons to build their own skills. So I present views from outer space in all of its glory. Ever since the push for a full view of the Earth, NASA has been recording and publishing photos and videos in high definition. The highest definition. All in the public domain. If the sight of Earth from beyond is humbling, if the beauty of the stars are awe-inspiring, the NASA Scientific Visualization Studio has it in spades. And we do too. And now, back to the show. A detective story is about getting to the truth in spite of some obstacle. In too many of them, the obstacle is legal red tape getting in the way of the investigation. It's a real shame that the law keeps getting in the way of law enforcement. But that's not the only way to do it. In proper noir fashion, John and Ed can get to the bottom of this case in part because they have been cast out by the powers that be, literally in John's case. As outsiders, they gain the insight that this society throws away lives. And the obstacle they have to overcome? That's the thing that has stuck with me since my first playthrough of Police Knots. All of the baddies are cops. Everyone you're supposed to shoot is a cop. I should have seen it coming. After all, in a Hideo Kojima game, the title is the thing you're fighting. They made sure to pack in a healthy variety of bad cop types, too. There's the next generation of policing, the AP unit Frozeners, including the recurring villain Tony Redwood. They're all kitted up, ready to bust doors, separated and isolated from the community they're policing. Even at his desk, Officer Redwood still has on his Kevlar and his sidearm. Think that's excessive? That's his casual wear. If he's out in public, he's usually in his military-grade vehicle. What's his problem? The AP unit reflects real-life units like the LAPD's Crash Unit or the Memphis Police's Scorpion Unit. Officer Redwood and the other next-generation cops have been genetically modified to better handle the conditions of space. They literally think that they are distinct from and above the communities they're policing. Initially, they seem to be the root cause of the problem. Redwood is not too subtle as a villain. But that can't be the beginning and end of what's wrong with the city. John was discarded by the system long before the AP unit was around. There's the old guard of policing on Beyond Coast 2. 
every one of the founding police knots are behind the clandestine operations. Everyone except for John and Ed. They all moved up the ladder in their own way. Became the chief of police, the tycoon running the moons above board and under the table exports, the CEO of the largest supranational corporation. The ones who didn't? Well, one was sabotaged on a spacewalk and the other has been stuck in a corner room in the basement. The Cabal realized that outer space is hostile to human life, and if we're going to keep producing, the system will need to treat humans as resources, as parts of the system and as spare parts. They see themselves as the ones who can be trusted to make the tough choices of who to make live and who to let die. As such, they've positioned themselves as the pillars of the community on Beyond Coast, not unlike Tokugawa Tower in the center of the space station. There's no room there for John and Ed, good apples unlikely to go with such a plot. Wait, I know where I've seen this. This is a reference to a 1970 painting by Rick Gedice of O'Neill Cylinders. But the original doesn't have the tower. Why is that tower so familiar? Going through the process of investigating as a cop serves as a counter to the behavior of regular policing too. The main characters are the outsiders, the ones stuck in dead-end jobs because they can't get promoted yet they're the only ones who can see the massive corruption around them. So, all the baddies are cops in the game. But are all the cops bad? John and Ed are cops, and they seem nice. They saved the day! Oh, I'll get to you too. Even though you have racked up a few dozen police murders by the end of the game, Police Knots basically lets policing as an institution off with a warning compared to Heinlein's writing. Robert Heinlein really likes the military, but that's where his love of jackboots ends. Something makes me think he doesn't like the cops. Any yellow jacket who arrested me would get a caress from number seven arm. Now about those so-called policemen, they were not sent to protect us. Our Declaration of Independence told the true story about those hoodlums. Did your newspapers print it? They went mad and started raping and murdering, and now they're dead, so don't send us any more troops. In Harsh Mistress, the whole justice system as we know it is portrayed as racist, sexist, and otherwise bigoted. Above all, it's arbitrary. Any sentence on the lunar colony can be a life sentence because the moon's low gravity weakens bones and shrinks muscle mass. Those that were born there, like Manny, are born captives. It's convenient to the Earth's governments because these life sentences allow the systems to make a killing on the resources that are produced. It's clearly not about discipline or punishment, it's about control. When the uprising starts, Earth's powers are practically salivating at the idea of just extinguishing these ungrateful prisoners and replacing them with people from India. The writing is cringe and doesn't accurately portray Eastern cultures, but it is a cutting critique of how Western powers think of them. Today, prison labor in the US and sweatshops in the Global South are the backbone of low-value goods. Companies put these institutions against each other in competitive bids for the lowest offer. If that's how Heinlein characterizes the police as we know it, how does he present the heroes fighting from under their boot? He doesn't mince words about the makeup of these prisoners either. There are a lot of people of color and people more likely to have non-normative relationships. Manny is a disabled person of color in a committed poly relationship. There's a lot of his story that is dedicated to explaining his family dynamics and how they are core to each other's survival. When Manny is Earthside in the middle of Act 2, he's quickly arrested for his criminal marriages by a racist cop. Though polygamy is still illegal, it's important to note that when this book came out, miscegenation, mixed race marriage, was also illegal across America. Wyo is a professional surrogate mother, 
after space radiation prevented her from having biological children of her own. Though she takes on a number of jobs in the book, she's often doing reproductive labor, not just giving birth, but also caregiving, child rearing, and cooking. Highland doesn't refer to it as reproductive labor, that's a Marxist term which is outside of his wheelhouse. I imagine it would be in Dr. De La Paz's vocabulary though, as the wise, pragmatic, vegetarian pacifist, a scholar specifically of South American revolutions, less George Washington and more Che Guevara. Rounding it out is Mycroft, the growing artificial intelligence who is developing a gender-fluid identity. When the writing is at its best, it feels like there's a genuine interest in capturing the diversity of the human experience and a depiction of the people more likely to be targeted by the legal system. At its worst, it feels like Heinlein is making up a black friend to win an argument. During Manny's trip down to Earth, the delegation attempts to corrupt Manny by turning him into the new warden, reinstating their control. The killing, the change in command, that's all fine. If the people of Luna will police themselves and will keep producing, all the better, as that'll cut down on the need to cycle in lunar authority enforcers. The important thing to the Earth delegation is that control remains. How does the delegation think this will be persuasive? To borrow a phrase from Franz Fanon, the delegation hopes that Manny is a colonized intellectual, a native who has internalized the worldview of the colonizer. Being able to think through situations from the perspective of the oppressor can be necessary under colonial rule, but during a revolution, that internalization can also lead to a backsliding from revolutionary thought. After all, thinking like a colonizer likely gave them special value, both under colonial rule and also at the start of the revolution. A totally new paradigm, one that they're unfamiliar to, could reduce their status in their community. Manny doesn't go for this and is able to escape back to the moon. However, Manny still seems to internalize the colonial framework he lived under his whole life. After all, though the Lunar Authority is eliminated, policing doesn't go away. Not quite. There had already been internal policing of the organizational members to suss out the informants from the true believers. When Luna begins self-governing, rules are instituted on how the surviving tunes must act in order to have access to the artificial gravity they need if they ever hope to return to Earth. This measure is just to control the situation they found themselves in. It's like they did all that fighting to remove the man in the watchtower, only to hire someone they think will be better for the job. Oh! That's where I've seen it! At the end of Police Knots, the Grand Conspiracy is uncovered for the Space Colony. And there is hope that with this transparency, things will change for the better. But how? It's not clear. The return to using plainclothes beat cops? That's how we got here in the first place. This also doesn't resolve the needs of the people on the Space Colony and Beyond Coast is still structurally designed for mass surveillance. That central pillar, the cylinder of the colony, the whole thing is a panopticon. Mikel Foucault refers to a lot of things like a prison. Is it surprising that prisons resemble factories, schools, barracks, hospitals, which all resemble prisons? The Panopticon was definitely a prison, though. Devised in the 1700s, the shape of the Panopticon was made so a central tower could observe each individual cell. But those that were confined didn't have an equal ability to watch the watcher. The potential of an observer, that someone with power could be watching, that was intended to produce an internal self-discipline. It's a great metaphor for the type of self-discipline the state tries to exert over people. 
Apparently, that metaphor wasn't subtle enough, because the Panopticon blueprint was then modernized in the 19th century by making a version that rotates. This was easier on the observing warden, much harder on the prisoners, though. Rotating had a nasty habit of taking their limbs. Just in case the mental picture wasn't clear that the prison system is a mental and physical meat grinder. Putting traditional cops in control at the end of police knots isn't the answer. No better example than our heroes, John and Ed. John and Ed can be skeevy. Hideo Kojima invariably gives his players the chance to be a lecher somewhere in his games. But whenever that is an option, the reward is a dunce cap. In Snatcher, Gillian Seed has dialogue options, allowing him to horn up on all the female characters when his wife isn't around. At the end, though, it's revealed they all have been talking to each other when Gillian wasn't around. It's really awkward if the player had Gillian coming on to all of them, while promising his wife he really wants to make their marriage work. Or in Metal Gear Solid 3, when Snake is starting to pick up on the fact that the other spy story of being an American defector in the Soviet Union doesn't add up. The way she held that gun, that's how it's done in China. If he and the player think about it for like a minute, they could figure out the twist at the end within the first hour of the game. If they aren't playing with the cutscene camera features to ogle her. In the other Hideo Kojima games, it is optional. But in Police Knots, it is required to progress, which sucks. It's important to remember that in this context, this isn't a benign act. John and Ed are operating with police authority, with the potential for state violence. Leering at people, touching them, this comes with baggage. This also echoes the sexual harassment and abuse that people endure from police in real life. Abuse that isn't just extra-legal, but sometimes enforcing the law as intended. Policing pregnancies, bodies, genitals. Heinlein's skeeviness is much more uncomfortable. It's really bizarre for a book that dedicates whole pages to consent-based practices to then miss the mark entirely on who can and can't consent. Harsh Mistress generally doesn't seem to understand the dynamics of rape. In the book, it is all but eliminated in the marketplace of reproduction in lunar society due to the large disparity of men to women. Because women are rarer in lunar society, when word breaks out that the lunar authority raped and killed women, that kicks off the revolution early. But rape isn't about scarcity, it's about control. And uh, women are not the only people who get raped. A plot thread that the book leaves dangling is that the revolution lies to push people to revolt against the Lunar Authority. The number of women who were raped, how they died, who in the Lunar Authority is responsible? Manny intentionally distorts that with the help of Mycroft. See, Manny believes details like that may reduce the impact of the news. But what if those distortions came to light later? How would it feel to be part of a violent insurrection only to find out that it was predicated on lies? That the women everyone is protective of were used in death for convenient messaging? What else could the revolution be lying about? That Luna would starve if it isn't free? That Adam Selene isn't a human? In this way, the inner circle, with all of their good intentions, make rash decisions, which may undermine the longevity of the Lunar Revolution. Overall, I feel like Harsh Mistress gets the conditions for a revolution, but elements of their post-revolutionary society are revolting. Science fiction novels and video games are a way to go on a high-flying adventure. When there is an eye for realism, it can also serve as a warning of the world that is coming. That there are going to be people and systems in search of new ventures and new people to control. 
it may also be a warning of the world that is already here. As realistic works, Police Knots and Harsh Mistress both do a great job of showcasing the pitfalls of societies of control, but it is also stuck in the reality of that thinking. Police Knots destroys a police precinct, only to replace it with a new group of cops. Harsh Mistress takes the warden out of a penal colony, only to install a new surveillance program. As fiction that contends with these real-world problems, it's compromising what is possible with what we're currently stuck with. In Walida Imerish's essay, To Build a Future Without Police and Prisons, We Have to Imagine It First, Miss Imerisha argues that, well, we have to imagine a future without police and prisons, through visionary fiction. That we start at, what is the world we want, rather than, what is a win that is possible and realistic? In her 2015 anthology, Octavia's Brood, Miss Imerisha collected stories from organizers writing fiction about worlds without war, without cops, without prisons. Her book was named after Octavia Butler, the famous sci-fi writer who wrote The Parable of the Sower, about humanity's destiny to settle among the stars. History is full of unrealistic wins achieved through visionary thinking. The Black Panther Free Breakfast Program fed poor children across America where the government couldn't or wouldn't. In 2020, Defund the Police got put in the books in Minneapolis. Even if the Free Breakfast Program is no longer here, even if that defund policy got reneged, the fact that it happened and can happen again can't be taken away. Police Knots and Harsh Mistress don't provide answers to the problems they identify so it's up to others to answer those questions. For Miss Marisha, all organizing is science fiction. After all, they are setting out to build new worlds, starting with the important questions like, what does everyone eat? Imagination sets the goalposts for us to strive for, and she asks us to imagine what sort of world we want. There are worlds out there with no observation tower in the center of the city. And even in a future where a police state is even more controlling, or gravity itself is used to keep us down, we can fight for something better. Thanks for watching. For more videos taking a look at cop-related media from a critical lens, I recommend Skip Intro's series on copaganda. I also recommend Browse Held High's series looking at Starship Troopers and the Greater Heinlein Canon. It really is something special. With so much of Police Knots and Harsh Mistress about food, the only question I have now is, what should I eat? A tube of bread? No, that sounds silly. I think I'll eat cake.